the Great Basin, a vast arid depression in the American West. Broad valleys alternating with towering jagged mountain ranges. Now modern highways cross the basin and we can traverse it in a day by car. Hundreds of years ago, it must have seemed much larger to the people here who traveled on foot, carrying all their worldly goods and living in scattered campsites. These people left only faint traces of their daily lives, traces that the archeologist has to use to infer how these people live. There are no stone buildings, no monuments, no roadways, only bits of stone and pottery. Sometimes luck is with us and wooden materials survive as in the case of the Bustos Wikiup site in eastern Nevada. Hunting and gathering, the simplest economy ever practiced by humankind and one of the most enduring. They lived here at least 150 years ago, perhaps even as early as the American Revolution. They were one of the last hunting and gathering groups in North America. We're going to show you how people lived here, what tools they used to make a living, and some of the things we learned here last summer, archeologically. This is a hard land. Vegetation grows slowly. Game was likely more scarce than it is now. And every year was different, so variable, that they had to know the plants and animals, the rocks, the shape of the hills, the weather. They could find their way with landmarks so faint, so indiscernible, that modern man is easily lost in this pinyon and juniper woodland. Imagine this, you and your family are here, naked, no tools, except those you can create with your imagination and your hands. Could you cut the logs for this shelter? Could you find food? Could you make fire? We want to show you how they lived. Cutting logs for this shelter with a stone chopping tool takes time. They added fire, fire to char the trees and to make the chopping easier. We found here the people used two methods to cut trees. They built a fire around it and chopped away the charred wood. If that failed, they dug underneath the tree, built a fire, and chopped away the weakened roots. Here's one of the root cut stumps. You can see the remains of the roots and the trunk. Others were cut above the ground. Let's go take a look at one. Here are some of the stumps left from cutting the trees above the ground. How do we know this is what happened? We were fortunate. We found a tree that a person had begun chopping and for some reason quit before being finished. Tried the chopping tool we found next to the tree. Dr. Sims will demonstrate for us. And the marks we made are virtually identical to the marks made long ago. By comparing these marks with those we found on the logs at the wikiups, we determined that these two methods were used to cut the logs for the structures. In fact, we counted the number of stone axe cut stumps in the area of the site, and it compared quite closely with the number of logs we find in the structures. The passing of years has taken a toll. Much of the wikiup structures have fallen down. The junipers have slumped from their original position. This one was reconstructed after excavation. The original position of the logs is approximated. After the superstructure was in place, the wikiups were finished by placing a cover of pine boughs on top, making it an adequate sunshade and surprisingly water repellent. Now that we've seen how the structures were built, let's turn to another major concern of Great Basin Indians. For that matter, people everywhere, food. As the term hunting and gathering suggests, the native diet in the Great Basin was varied, consisting of animals from lizards to insect larvae to bighorn sheep, and plants were also important because the seeds and nuts of over 100 edible plants could be stored, providing a staple supply for the often harsh winters. In this region, a major winter staple was the nutritious and tasty nut from the pinyon pine. 
The nuts were gathered either by roasting open the green ones, knocking the nuts from the brown cones, or for a brief time of the year, picking the fallen nuts from the ground. Pine nuts are nutritious, providing about 2,000 calories and many nutrients per pound. But they had to be able to be stored because pine nuts are only available in the fall and competition from the birds and rodents for the same nuts was often severe. To protect their winter food supply, the people built stone storage facilities. Dr. Sims explains. We found eight stone circles such as this one in the vicinity of the Wikiup site. Pine cones were piled into the middle and then covered by a layer of cedar boughs to repel the insects and rodents. Then a layer of stones was placed on top to hold the nuts in place. The circle effect is created when the cedar boughs and stones are removed and thrown outward to retrieve the nuts. Most of the men being up here, well, except for things like this. <laughs> yes, and we seem to find isolated grinding stones all over the area. You know, that would make sense, though, because we've got the lithic scatters down slope on the east side of the site, so that could conceivably be the men's working area, then. Let's go yes. take a look at that one big lithic scatter. Okay. These people needed tools with sharp edges just as we do. They made the sharp edges by chipping stone. Here's an area covered with the remains of stone tool working, called a lithic scatter. We think this side of the site was probably a men's working area because men are usually the ones responsible for making tools with sharp cutting edges. So this is like a workshop area. Yeah. In fact, here are several flakes that look as though they came from one piece of raw material or one core. Now we've seen the leftovers from the manufacturing process. Let's go take a look at their uh, stockpile of raw materials or their hardware store. All a man had to do to make tools with sharp cutting edges is to find a nodule of a usable glassy stone. A lot of it around here is eroding out of the surface sediments. Of course, finding an appropriate hammer stone as well. Start making chips. And even with one of these chips, we have a pretty usable cutting edge. Typically, near the end of this summer's field work, we discovered a structure entirely different from the Wikiups across the wash from them. Dr. Sims will tell us about it. Over here, well away from the main cluster of Wikiups, we have a structure that's very different from the others. We know it's an aboriginal structure, evidenced by the stone axe cut logs. In this case, they arranged the logs one on top of each other in a cribbed fashion. Here, here, and here, forming a circular structure with a slight depression in the middle. We really don't know what it is. One possibility is a sweat lodge. The ridge the site is on. Archaeologists today study behavior, not things. We want to know from little fragments we see as much as we can about what their days were like. Let's take a look at a map of the ridge. It shows the location of various activities. We can say stone tools were made here. The houses were here. And food was stored here in the stone rings. Well, it's been fun. The students learned a lot. We learned a lot. It was a good field season. Steve, what's most exciting to you here, most interesting about this site and about our work last summer? Well, scientifically or in general? So, either or both. Well, in a general sense, this is one of those sites that literally makes the past come alive. And that's related to the scientific interest as well. Well, you know how ephemeral the remains of hunter-gatherers can be. Indeed I do. And it points up to me again how very difficult campsite archaeology is to do, at least from a technical standpoint. Precisely. So when you do get a site with this kind of preservation, it gives you a chance to see the different behaviors patterned across the site. So 
we do pretty much know the where and the what in a journalistic sense. The who, perhaps, and the when, we'll have to wait for further analysis. And then there's all the material remains that we didn't talk about. Right, like basketry. People here made beautiful baskets. This one's a burden basket, probably used uh, similarly to a modern pack frame for carrying whatever needed to be carried, and pottery. This is the bottom of a pot found near here, probably used to, as a container for food or as a container for water. And then, of course, all of the things of their metaphysical world we can't know about directly. Who were their gods? What did they call their relatives? But archaeologically, we can learn a great deal from the material culture. A difficult life in some ways, but perhaps not such a bad one. No schedules except those imposed by nature. No traffic jams and, of course, no supermarkets. The people who once lived here no longer do. Archaeological sites like this one are destroyed every year by modern construction and vandalism. The few existing sites, such as here, which is pristine, are all we have scientifically for a small window into a large past. This way of life was humanity's for 99% of our time on the planet. A large part of our past indeed, yet one of the most difficult to trace, and in many ways the part we know the least about.